Hey everyone, my name is Jacob and I'm one of the Docker captains and also the creator of a tool called Mutagen. And today I want to talk to you about Docker contexts because I think they're a really under-advertised feature, but they're really easy to understand, they're really easy to use, and I think for a lot of you they might simplify your day-to-day -day workflow if you're not using them already. So it'll be a real quick talk, just a quick overview, uh, and I'll make the slides and the recording available later. Um, but yeah, let's jump in. So real quickly, I just want to review the Docker architecture. I think for a lot of users, especially those who work with Docker Desktop, uh, it might seem like Docker is this monolithic component, but it's actually a client-server architecture that's a lot like a web API. In fact, it even uses HTTP as its underlying protocol, and it provides a RESTful interface for managing container-related resources. And there are a bunch of different clients for this API, you know, some of which you're familiar with, like the Docker Command and Docker Compose, but really any client that has access can connect to this API and manage resources there. So the protocol is HTTP, and there's a number of transports available, uh, things like Unix domain sockets, which are the default option, but also Windows named pipes, uh, TCP, which is you know, insecure and so it's not enabled by default, but you can combine that with TLS or you can access Docker uh, over SSH. So the architecture is really, really flexible. And the important thing is that you know, much in the same way you can point your web browser at multiple websites, you can also point your Docker tools at remote Docker engines and actually other container platforms as well. So how would you do that? Um, so by default, Docker clients are going to try to access the Docker engine by connecting to slash var slash run slash docker.sock, which is a Unix domain socket. And Docker Desktop does some magic to make this work with its Linux VM, so it's a little bit different there, but that's the default behavior. Uh, so you can change that with command line flags, like you've probably seen the dash dash host flag and a couple of dash dash TLS flags on the top level Docker command. And this is really flexible, but it's kind of tedious because you have to do it for every command where you want to target a different engine. So uh, instead of that, you can use environment variables like Docker host, where you can target a different endpoint. Um, like here, you've got a Unix domain socket you're targeting. Maybe you forwarded that over SSH to a remote Docker engine. And uh, if you're using TCP, you can use the Docker TLS var uh, variables to enable TLS if you want. But that can be a bit tedious and error prone and uh, actually, the TLS environment variables aren't really as flexible as the command line options, so it just makes doing that kind of all a little bit tricky. So uh, given that complexity, you might ask, you know, I already have Docker Desktop, you know, why on earth would I want to use other Docker engines? And that's a fair question, and the answer is that you might not need this functionality. But I think it's worth at least understanding how flexible this architecture can be, uh, even for development stuff. Uh, so if you're on an M1 Mac, for example, which is ARM64 based, but you're deploying to x86-64, then you might want to test that locally before you push or deploy to, um, to your production environment. You might also want to do uh, cross-architecture builds, which, you know, of course, you can do with BuildKit and, and the build push GitHub action. Um, but sometimes you just want something simple and local and quick. And some projects actually use Docker to uh, build and cross-compile executables, like Compose, for example. And in that case, it might actually be better to use something other than the Docker desktop VM to do those kind of more demanding compilation tasks. Um, if you're feeling really adventurous, you can use a tool like Mutagen or VS Code or Docker Sync to actually uh, develop your application on a cloud-based Docker engine. Uh, and that can be useful if maybe there are services uh, or a staging or testing database that you can't really emulate locally, uh, in which case you might want to co-locate your development environment in the cloud with those services. Um, and then finally, yeah, if you're at a small startup, then there's probably a good chance that you're going to be doing some sort of deployment work, uh, in which case the Docker context functionality can also help with that. Okay, so what are Docker contexts, actually? Um, the 10-second summary is that they're an easy way to store connection information and configuration, and then to switch between multiple Docker engines. So you can kind of think of them like shortcuts or aliases uh, for targeting different Docker engines. And there's a little bit more to it than that, but from a use case perspective, that's kind of the gist of it. So in terms of how you use Docker Context, it's pretty simple. Um, you just manage them with the Docker Context commands, just like any other Docker resource. Uh, you know, you have create, remove, list, uh, inspect commands. And you can create a context with a specified name, uh, and then you give it different connection parameters that Docker is going to store on disk, things like endpoint URL, TLS information, uh, stuff like that. And then you can set the active context, so that's the one that's going to be used by default using the docker context use command. And then after that, all of the various docker clients, at least the ones that understand contexts, 
are going to use that context by default. Uh, you can also specify the context to use on a per command basis with the context flag, uh, which is a little bit cumbersome, but at least in this case, all you have to specify is a single name and not all of the you know, more complex connection information strings. And then uh, once you're done with that, you can switch back to the Docker desktop context, which is a built-in context called desktop-linux. Uh, you can also switch back to the default context, which is basically just saying to use the standard legacy Docker host behavior. And actually with Docker desktop, switching to default will have the same effect as explicitly choosing desktop-linux. Uh, so I would recommend just using the default context if you're using Docker desktop. And really quick, I just want to address one point, which is the difference between the default and the active context. So the default context is a built-in context. It's named default, it's immutable, and it basically just says use Docker's default behavior and the sort of legacy environment variables like Docker host. Um, the active context is the context that's being used by Docker uh, clients automatically. So it's referred to as the current context sometimes in the documentation, but it's whatever's been set by the Docker context use command. And it could be the context that's named default, but it could be some other context. Uh, the confusing thing is just that the help information for Docker context use mentions that it sets the default context, but what it really means is that it sets the active or the current context. So yeah, don't let that confuse you. Uh, it kind of confused me at first. Okay, so with that, let's jump into the terminal and we'll just give a real quick demo about how you might actually use Docker contexts on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay, so let's start by looking at the default setup by using the docker version command. So this is with docker desktop, and as you can see, I'm running on an Intel Mac, and therefore I have an Intel-based docker client and an Intel-based docker engine that's running in the docker for Mac VM. Now, I've also got a Raspberry Pi next to my desk with docker engine installed, so what I'm going to do is create an SSH session that will forward a socket from my laptop to the docker engine socket on the Raspberry Pi. You can also just use docker's SSH transport directly, but I tend to find forwarding to be a little bit more flexible and robust, uh, and there are also ways that you can make that forwarding persistent. So once we have that forwarding set up, we're going to create a new Docker context called RPI. We'll give it a description of Raspberry Pi, and we'll set the host parameter to point at the socket that we just forwarded. Uh, you can also provide other parameters as part of the Docker flag argument, like TLS stuff, and you can find all the information on that in the Docker context documentation. And now if we do a Docker context LS, we'll see the new context that we just created. So now we can switch to using that context by default using the docker context to use command. And if we do that and we run docker version, you'll see that we're still using the same client, but now we're talking to a remote docker engine. In this case, it's one that's ARM64 based and running on the Raspberry Pi. So now what I wanna do is start up a compose project from my laptop that's going to run on the remote docker engine. So one thing to point out here is that the Docker distribution that you install on Debian or Raspberry Pi OS, for example, it includes BuildKit, but it doesn't have it enabled by default at the moment. So you'll probably want to export the Docker BuildKit equals one environment variable, uh, usually in your shell initialization script, especially if you're going to be working with a lot of remote Docker engines. And then we'll bring that project up and go ahead and wait for that to start. And then once that's started, uh, we'll go ahead and pop over to the browser and put in the Raspberry Pi's IP address and port. And you'll see that the simple demo app that we have here loads just as it would if it was running locally. And um, obviously with both uh, standalone containers and composed projects, there's the caveat that bind mounts aren't going to work uh, with a remote Docker engine. So if you want to do that, you'll have to set up some sort of code synchronization system. Uh, but if you just want to test the static configuration for a project or deploy a project, then this will work just fine. Uh, and then we'll go back to the project and tear that down real quick. Uh, and then once that's done, uh, we'll go ahead and switch back to the default context. And then if we run uh, Docker version again, we'll see that we're back to targeting Docker desktop. And then finally, we can go ahead and remove the RPI context that we created just to show how that's done. But obviously in you know most cases, you'll probably want to leave that sitting around. Okay, so hopefully that clarifies Docker contexts a little bit. Uh, as with everything, the rabbit hole always goes a little bit deeper. Uh, and Docker contexts, in some sense, are really just more of a general abstraction layer. So you can create contexts not just for a single Docker engine, but also for Docker swarms, which are clusters of Docker engines, uh, Kubernetes clusters, and even cloud platforms like ACI and ECS. And then you can use Docker Stack and Docker Compose to deploy applications to those platforms. That's you know, definitely outside the scope of a 10 minute talk, but there are other talks and blog posts and documentation that you can check out on how to use that functionality if that's something that interests you.
But yeah, it's really simple. Uh, Docker contexts are basically just a way to store configuration. They're a way to switch between different Docker engines, and they're the way that you access cloud integrations. So thanks for listening. I know it's not going to revolutionize your Docker usage, um, but I hope it'll just make things a little bit simpler for you, maybe on a day-to-day -day basis, and you know, maybe open up ideas for you about how you might incorporate remote Docker engines, whether that's you know in your office or in the cloud or wherever, into your day-to-day -day workflows. Uh, but as always, like if it doesn't add any value to your workflow, don't overcomplicate things. And you know, Docker Desktop is really all you need for most of your development. Thanks for listening. Uh, have a good day and stay safe. And feel free to send me any questions that you might have on Twitter or wherever. Thanks.